بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last time we met we discussed the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم attempt to call the leaders of different regions and empires and kingdoms around Arabia to call them to Islam. Now, with the truce implemented between the Muslims and the polytheists of Quraysh, the Prophet وسلم, sent his ambassadors and his envoys to the different regions of the world. And among whom he had sent was Abdullah ibn Hudhafa, and he sent him with a letter that was sealed by the Prophet ﷺ, and he instructed him to take it to Kisra, the ruler of Persia. We are told that when Kisra took a look at the letter, he was frustrated. And he, out of arrogance and pride, said, how dare one of my servants talked to me in this manner. And not realizing the power of the Muslims and not realizing the essence of the call of Islam, he wrote to his ruler in Yemen, whose name was Badan, and he instructed him to bring this man to Persia. So Badan sent, again, not evaluating the situation as it's supposed to be, he sent two men to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And they came in arrogance to the Prophet ﷺ. And the minute the Prophet ﷺ saw them, he was astonished by the way they looked because they shaved their beards and grew their mustaches. And this was not something that the Arabs recognized or knew. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, who ordered you to do such a thing with yourselves? So they said, our God ordered us, meaning that their leader, their ruler, they considered him to be a God. So the Prophet ﷺ answered them by saying, my God, my Lord, Allah the Almighty, ordered me to grow my beard and to cut short my mustache. And this is the sunnah. And it is not a sunnah in the sense that if you do it, it's preferable and you're rewarded. And if you don't follow it, then you have nothing to be afraid of. On the contrary, the consensus of scholars is that it is forbidden to shave the beard. And all four schools of thought of Islam and all scholars agree on this issue. So the Prophet ﷺ asked them about what they came for. And they told him that they were told and instructed to detain him and bring him back to Persia. But when they saw the might and the strength of the Muslims, you know, they just told him, we were just messengers. And our ruler and our Lord tore your letter and he was very angry with you. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, come the following day. And during the night, Allah revealed to his messenger ﷺ something of importance. So the following day came and they attended the court of the Prophet ﷺ. And he told them that my Lord revealed to me last night that your Lord has been assassinated. So they were more furious. They came to detain the Prophet ﷺ because of the letter he tore. And now you're accusing and you are saying that our Lord has been assassinated and killed. This is even worse. Shall we go and tell our master about these things you're just fabricating so that he would become more angry of you? Prophet told them, go and tell him. So they went back to Badan, the ruler of Yemen. 
with an advice from the Prophet ﷺ. He told them, advise your master, Bathan, that if he were to embrace and accept Islam, he will be the ruler of his people. And this was, as mentioned before, the habit and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Whenever he called someone to Islam, if the leader accepts Islam, he kept him as a leader of his people. And this is, you know, the best way of handling and governing people. If you bring them someone who's fresh and new from out of their customs and region, they would probably reject him. So the Prophet ﷺ had a very good sense of governing people. So they went, the messengers, went back to Bathan and told him that the man you sent us to detain was not an easy catch. He was surrounded by so many brave people and when we told him so and so, he told us that your leader, your Kisra, the leader of Persia, is dead, has been assassinated. And he's asking you to accept Islam. And Badan was astonished. And a few weeks later came the news from Persia that Kisra was assassinated by his son. And his son was Shirweh. So he killed his father. And they calculated the date when the messengers were in Medina and the date when the head of Persia died or was assassinated. And they found it to be the exact date that the Prophet ﷺ prophesied and told him what Allah Azzawajal had revealed to him. And that was one of the main reasons that Badan himself and his people of Yemen Great. accepted Islam later on. Of course, Shirwe was, well, actually he died soon afterwards and he was succeeded by his daughter. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to know this, he said that no people would prosper if they had a woman ruling and leading them. And this is what Islam is preaching, that women are not to rule, not to be the head of state, not to be a judge, not to mix and mingle with men. A woman has her role in her house, taking care of her children, taking care of her husband, teaching other women, having her own society with other women, but to be far and away from men. And men are also instructed to be far away from women. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ never had a woman leading prayer. He never had a military detachment led by a woman. There are so many examples, but this unfortunately is not the time to talk about. It's always useful to hint and point out things that people are taking for granted. They think that, well, it's okay for men to work with women. No, it's not okay. And this is for the benefit of women and the benefit of men to be separated, each in their own field. I believe we have a short break. Stay tuned. We will be back. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. The Prophet wasallam also sent Amr ibn Umayyah al-Dumari to the Najashi. And the Najashi, as we know, is the name of the ruler of Abyssinia. So whoever took charge of the country was called an Najashi. And we all remember that when the Muslims were oppressed in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ ordered a group of the Muslims to go and migrate to Abyssinia. And this was by itself a challenge because the Muslims in Mecca never got onto boats and sailed. So they had to sail across the Red Sea, headed west, and this was an experience second to none. And they had to migrate to a country that 
was not similar to theirs, neither the climate nor even the language. They were not Arabs. Yet he sent the Prophet ﷺ, his cousin, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, and a group of Muslims moved there, and we know what happened between the people of Quraysh, the polytheists, when they tried to have the king of Abyssinia, the Najashi, send these people back to Mecca, and they failed in the process. So the Prophet ﷺ sent his companion, Amr ibn Umayyah, to Abyssinia to ask and invite a Najashi to Islam. And a Najashi accepted Islam, as we know, and he was the only leader of these great empires and kingdoms that accepted Islam. And when he died, some historians say that was on the ninth year of Hijrah, the Prophet وسلم, performed the prayer of the dead, the funeral prayer, though he was not present, because Allah revealed to him that your friend in Abyssinia and Najashi has died. And this is one of the things that scholars usually put as a puzzle. And they would say, who is the companion of the Prophet والسلام, who never saw him? Yes. Najashi. Why do they say this? Because the definition of a companion is a person who accepted Islam and saw the Prophet wasallam. As for the Najashi, he could not have the pleasure, honor of seeing or meeting the Prophet wasallam. He accepted Islam and the Prophet wasallam performed the funeral prayer when he was informed that he had passed away. On that time, or close to it, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and a number or a group of his companions from Yemen heard of the Prophet ﷺ. So they wanted to go and accept Islam. They sailed from Yemen, headed to the western area of Arabia so that they could go and would be shorter for them to go to Medina. But their boat took them to Abyssinia on the other side of the coast. They were met by Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, and once he knew that they were Arabs and they wanted to embrace Islam, he told them about Islam, and alhamdulillah, they accepted Islam and stayed with Ja'far ibn Abi Talib in Abyssinia. And they all came back on the seventh year of Hijrah at the time of Ghazwat Khaybar, the expedition of Khaybar. And we will get to talk about that, inshallah, later on. And Najashi also, in that period of time, was requested by the Prophet والسلام, to act as his agent so that he would marry one of the companions that was there. And she was Um Habiba bint Abi Sufyan. She was the daughter of Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, the leader of Mecca. But she herself was a Muslimah. And she migrated to Abyssinia with her husband, Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, who unfortunately rejected Islam there and became a Christian because his Islam initially was not authentic. He reverted to Islam for his wife. And when they migrated to Abyssinia, he could not tolerate being away, so he rejected Islam, accepted Christianity, and died as a disbeliever. And because she was the daughter of the leader of Quraysh, and now she was on her own, well, not widowed actually, because he was not her husband. The minute he rejected Islam, her marriage contract was void. So in order to honor such a lady, the Prophet ﷺ sent to the Najashi, telling him that he wants to marry Um Habiba, and he sent him the request to act on his behalf in completing the marriage contract. The Najashi did so, and he gave her a dowry from his own, and she became the wife's prophet by this marriage contract. So a Najashi was a good ally of Islam and of 
the Muslims. When he received the message from the Prophet ﷺ, he honored the messenger and he gave him gifts and he accepted Islam with the grace of Allah. Shaykh, does, does that mean a marriage can be performed in the absence of a woman? Yes, in the absence of a woman. Well, well, she was not with the, the groom. So. See, there is the marriage contract and this is different than the actual marriage. So if someone has a woman in mind and he's in a country and she's in another country, he may give the power of authority to someone he trusts so that he would accomplish and complete the marriage contract as a contract. But of course, this man does not take his role in everything. He's not the husband. He just finishes the contract. By this, we mean if I give the power of authority to Abdullah and Abdullah goes and proposes to the father of this girl and the father accepts. He's proposing on my behalf. He's telling them I'm coming on behalf of so and so. And they accept this marriage. He gives the dowry. There are witnesses. The woman accepts. The marriage has been completed. Now she is my wife, though I'm overseas. I'm in a different country. If she comes with her father or her brother to my country, if I go, we can talk, we can do whatever. She's my wife. So this is acceptable. The question that someone may ask, can a woman be married without her guardian, without her wali? And the answer is no, because the Prophet wasallam said that there is no marriage that is acceptable or it's invalid when a marriage takes place without the presence of a wali, the guardian of the woman, and the presence of two witnesses. So who was the wali in Um Habiba's case? Najashi. He was the Najashi. Why? The, male of the, uh, the leader. He is the leader, he is the ruler. So Najashi was acting on behalf both sides. So he's acting on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu given the power of authority to conduct the marriage. And he was acting on behalf of the woman, Um Habiba. May Allah be pleased with her by completing also this marriage. Amr ibn Umayyah, he also requested the Najashi to send those who were in Abyssinia from the Muslims and so he did he. He brought two big ships and he put in them all the migrants, the Muslims that wanted to go to Medina and they came to the Prophet ﷺ on the seventh year of Hijrah. Jafar ibn Abi Talib and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and everyone that who were uh, with them. Another messenger of the Prophet والسلام, was Hatib ibn Abi Balta. Now Hatib is well known because he is one of those who attended Badr and Allah Azza wa has forgiven the sins of those who attended the battle of Badr. Hatib was sent by the Prophet والسلام, to the Muqawqas and again this is a title it's not a name of a person it's a title for whoever rules Egypt at the time. So he sent him to the Coptic leader, al muqawqas and he gave him the letter. He unsealed it. He read the letter. He did not accept it, but he did not reject it at the same time. He told Hatib that as a Christian, we know that this is the time for a prophet to be sent to the world. But we did not think that he would become one of the descendants of Ishmael. We thought that he was one of the descendants of Isaac from the Jews. So what does he call for? So Hatib was telling him that he calls for this and that, that we connect our next of kin, that we do not worship except one God, and that is Allah the Almighty, the only worthy of being worshipped, and that we should avoid vice and call people to virtue. We pray, we fast, we give the poor do, the zakat, the charity, and the more you do these good deeds, the closer you are to Allah. So Al-Muqawqas again looked 
at it and said, I don't see that he forbids something that is needed and he doesn't ask for something that is not wanted. All what he's calling for are good things. Every, it's natural and any fair, any objective person, any person who is not biased would know that Islam is the perfect religion, that it is a natural religion. So he honored Hatib, the messenger. He honored the message that he got and he put it in a very expensive and valuable vessel so that he would honor it. And he sent with him two slaves, two female maids and a mule to the Prophet Sallallahu along with some clothes, expensive clothes. And he told the Prophet ﷺ that these maids are among the best slaves in Egypt. They are yours as a sign of good gesture. And the Prophet ﷺ accepted the maids. He took one of them to himself and gave the other to Hassan ibn Thabit. The one whom he took was, what's her name, do you remember? Maria. Maria. And she is the mother of his son, Ibrahim, who died when he was six months or two years old, depending on the narrations. And his mule was known to be with the name of Juljul. And it, it's a habit that people call their mules or camels. I believe that this is all the time we have for today's program. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.